to see everybody logging on. Um, we'll just give it a minute or two. Um, make sure everybody found their link. Uh, I have to apologize for being in the shadows here a little bit. I, my lighting at night is terrible. Um, but I look younger in the shadow. So, you know, there are some advantages to that. <laughs> We'll take whatever we can get, right, Whitney? <laughs> Sandy, you're the fountain of youth forever, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, we had over 50 registers. Sometimes they do that for the... Um, uh, access to the recording or a link to the recording. So um, I want to introduce uh, Jeffrey. Um, he's going to be working with me on that. And another one of our working group, Erin, um, she is, uh, will, she will be here. She lives a little bit out in the middle of nowhere where the internet is not always the greatest. Um, Jeffrey, why don't you tell everybody just a little bit about yourself? Great. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm Jeffrey Montoya. I am a massage therapist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There I have a private practice with two locations as well as I direct a massage school. Um, I've been a massage therapist for 10 years. I also hold a doctorate degree in health professions education, um, which I got in 2000 doesn't seem that long ago, but I have been working with Sandy on the working group for about a year and a half, which has been really great. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, uh, one of the things I did try to do was, uh, and Whitney and Dolly and some of the others will appreciate this. I tried to reach out and uh, encourage the next generation to come forward and move forward on this because it's such an important topic as far as I am concerned. So um, that's, uh, you know, besides Jeffrey does an excellent job and, and he's uh, got his pulse on both being a practitioner and with the uh, school. So that's really, really good. Let me give you a little idea how this is going to work. Just, to, just some housekeeping. Um, the meeting will probably not last three hours, even though that's what it's got on there. Uh, we'll shoot more for an hour and a half to two hours, depending on how discussion goes. Um, I like to keep things a little less formal uh, in terms of these forums, and I want to encourage discussion. Uh, initially, what I plan to do is show you some links uh, that are relevant to uh, where our discussion will actually go. I don't, I don't intend to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I've got these up on a, web, uh, a Word document that that's, I'm going to share my screen to, and then um, I'll have to go through a little bit of opening it and closing and all that to actually get the website to open. What I encourage you to do, if you've got your camera phone uh, is, I'll leave that up for a few minutes. You can take a picture of it. And then that way you'll have access to these links as well. Some of you know what these links are and uh, our, uh, others may not have heard about what they are. I was recruited almost two years ago um, and uh, one of my passions for many, many, many years has been a unifying language. Uh, I have been a vocal, uh, as some of you on the call can attest to, about the importance of being able to speak to each other within our own discipline, but also interdisciplinary. Um, Paul Stanley, along, uh, it, I met um, back in 2007 at the original Fascia Research Congress. And I was in the audience just sitting there. There's Aaron. And he 
he's a bench scientist and he um, was standing there with all of us massage therapists and osteopaths and structural integration people and you know how we are. I don't have to explain that. And he was just so befuddled. <laughs> I'll never forget it, bless his heart. And he stood up on that stage and he said, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And I can't research it if I don't know what you're talking about and how you're describing it. That uh, and, and uh, Dr. Brian, um, they kept that dream. And so after many, many years, here we are now. So uh, the first thing I want to do, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I forget that people don't know me. I am Sandy Fritz. I am Sandy Fritz. And I uh, have been involved in the massage world for almost 45 years now. Um, I made Whitney laugh earlier when I said one of the advantages to being in the shadows here is it makes me look younger. <laughs> so, but I'm pushing that 7-0. And still, I have a massage therapy school, still actively teach, still see clients. Um, and I, but I am so committed to developing the future. And uh, my, my past isn't that relevant to those that are moving currently into the massage community and into the future. Uh, it needs to be them reaching forward and developing the future with our guidance. Um, so, you know, I've been around all the major meetings that people might talk about or whatever. I've been there, uh, sitting there in the middle of all of those things. And uh, that brings a unique perspective to where we are now. And, you know, we're further along than we think. So uh, let me bumble through getting the uh, website up. To, I just want to introduce you to the ICMT. So I got to do a screen share, then I have to hit the button, and then I have to share again. And Jessica, you're going to give me a thumbs up if you see the screen. All right, so this is the one you may want to take a picture of. These are some links that um i think uh worth more ex exploration especially elap if you're not familiar with that so as we look towards a language um one of the things where massage therapy is really ahead of the game on this is we went through that whole conundrum a few years ago um through the ELAP process, entry-level analysis process. And it was quite a ride when we went through all of that. Uh, but that is the foundation for the uh, language that Jeffrey and Aaron and I put forth. All right, do you see the website? All right. So I'm not gonna spend tons and tons of time on this, but I. I really encourage all of you that are on the call to get onto this website and explore. This is so cool. I am so excited about this. And, and at this point in my career, to be able to uh, push one more thing off of my bucket list, which is a unifying language, uh, it's uh, just been a thrill for me to be part of this. Um, on the website here, you can see that it talks about the conference and the schedule and how to register. Um, we had a shift in how this is going to happen, and I'm thrilled with the change. Um, we're moved, the, it's moved to a total online virtual platform, and there's actually going to be a month's worth of interaction here with two days of formal focused scheduling, and then a, a two week period, and then two more days. And I'll show you a little bit about the venue called Gather Town, and uh, it, you make yourself a little avatar 
and you run around in this thing. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. I made myself a little gray haired avatar and I just go in there and I bump around. And uh, I believe that this is gonna open the ability for more and more and more massage therapists to attend. Um, there isn't the travel. We don't have to worry about what might happen at the last minute. This is an international consortium. So there were our, our compadres that are uh, in Australia and South America and, and South Africa and in Europe. Uh, this makes it much more advantageous for them to be able to do this. And to be able to have the ability to have interface, uh, in, informal interface of the whole month on this platform, I think is terrific. You know, we can put an announcement up that that Jeffrey, Jeffrey is gonna be available in the park and he's gonna sit there and you can take your little avatar and you can walk up to him and, and, and the screen will open and you can talk to him just like we're talking now. It's really, technology really has gone a long way. So uh, I really do believe that this platform is gonna allow for a much more, uh, a, a, an attendance process that especially for the massage community because of the cost savings for the travel and the hotel and all that will make a big difference for us. Uh, if I scroll down this a little bit, um, this is something else I wanna point out. These are our keynote speakers. Now, I don't know, is it Nielsen? Is that uh, Dr. Nielsen? Uh, I've never met Dr. Nielsen, but Helen Lajevin has been an important part of massage therapy for many, 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 many years. And she's now director of the National Center of Complementary and Integrative Health. And uh, I haven't had obviously direct discussions about this with her, um, but others on the executive committee have been. And she also is thrilled about the idea of a unifying language with a major uh, agenda to support research. And that's another place we're a little more advanced than one might think. There is really good research uh, out there about massage therapy, um, certainly not enough, but we're, we're doing really well. And if we had better parameters for designing research processes, it would even be uh, more productive not just for us, but cross-discipline, where I can look at a piece of research from physical therapy and I can understand what they're doing because of a unifying language and they can look at a massage therapy research paper and they can understand. So I'm really thrilled about that. And we have the Massage Therapy Foundation that is our research arm. So um, I'm proud of us for that. Um, so um, this is not the type of conference you've been to before, at least not that I have been to before. Uh, this is very interactive. What you're gonna see in a, just a minute here, what the, our work group has done, all the other work groups have done that, it's just a start to bring to the profession uh, and the broader professions of manual therapy for us to continue to promote and collaborate. Uh, the whole program is built on discussion and collaboration. It's a start, this is only a beginning. Um, and hopefully uh, it will be one that takes us, uh, evolves us to the next step that we wanna go in massage therapy. Um, so we're, we talked about what we do. And then we talked about how we think that works. And then our scientists are, <laughs> they are going through hundreds and hundreds of papers looking for summarizing to see if what we think we do is actually what we do. 
and that should then inform future research. So this is extremely uh, exciting and very important. Um, so it isn't about trying to make everybody the same. Um, that, is, that was never the intention. It's about understanding how we are similar so we can collaborate, finding terms that make sense across discipline that we can report with when we're doing research or if we're writing textbooks like I do. Um, and that, you know, there's just, we're so siloed. And in massage therapy, I think there's like 300 different disciplines. <coughs> and they all call things a little different. So it's hard to know. You know, when, when I was on the road teaching, somebody would say da 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 method and i'd have to say you're going to have to show me show me what you're talking about and then i'll be able to frame what it is so we've got some great sponsors here's our little gather town um i'll come back to that a little later so do please explore the website <laughs> and get a sense of um all of the wonderful people that are in the background that are working on this. Um, and there's, there's our Dr. Brian right there. <laughs> and there's Paul Stanley um, and Jan and Francisco. He's, he's in Europe, I think. Well, he's in Italy, I think. Italian. There's our Jessica. What would we do without Jessica? And Jeffrey, again, he's the tech behind the scenes. Oh, no, there I am. And there's Norm Kettner. What a joy. He's a chiropractor, researcher. Oh, my goodness. What an icon. And there's David. Uh, he's very active within the structural integration. He's actually the one that recruited me for the uh, Comfort for the consortium, and the list goes on and on. So, so the website gives you a ton of information about how broad based this is. Okay, so the focus tonight for you all is to see what we, how far we have come over the last two years. And it, it truly has been a journey as we have met every other Friday for a couple of hours. For, and we have tried to learn about ourselves. Um, Jeffrey, what is that like to listen to the other professions try to figure out massage and us try to figure them out? Uh, most of the time, it has been a lot of fun. From time to time, it gets a little heated. Um, we have discovered all sorts of things. Um, it has caused us to really, as you mentioned, um, kind of define among ourselves as massage therapists what we are talking about and what we do and believe about what we do, and then to see how that compares with people who are chiropractors, physical therapists, structural integration integrators, and see how sometimes we're talking about the same thing with very different language. Sometimes we're talking about different things with the same language, and um, you mentioned already that massage has already kind of come a long way. I think very often I have thought of our profession as behind or not really advanced, but I, doing this work, I've really, especially watching the chiropractors kind of bicker between themselves or the um, structural integrators argue about terms, I'm like, oh, we actually have more um, we have actually done work as a profession to really define things. Um, and be a little bit more consistent. Obviously, there's always work to do and we still have a, a long way to go, but it has really made me appreciate um, the stuff that, that those who have come before me, you, Sandy, and others have really done to define our field and to um, bring a cohesiveness. You mentioned the ELAP. And mm -hmm. so it's been really very enlightening and I would say overall, really enjoyable to be able to work with the people of the different disciplines and kind of compare notes. Um, and at times it gets a little a little interesting and kind of in a good way to really, people are passionate and they're invested in what they do. They believe in what they do. 
And so um, it has been really enlightening to me. And, and um, here in Wisconsin, my time zone, those calls have been 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning. And I usually like to start my day around 10, but I have gotten up early in order to um, participate because I do find it really meaningful and enjoyable. And as you mentioned, really important for our profession and really for the entire um, field of manual therapy. Yeah, and one of the things I wanna to mention too, um, sometimes massage therapists have uh, a professional identity issue in the sense that, oh, we need more education or we're not seen as healthcare providers or the list goes on and on. That has not been my experience in this group at all. They uh, appreciate the uh, quality of the work that we do. Uh, there was no demand specifically for additional education other than everybody learning about what we all do. There was a pleasant surprise at the scope of practice for massage therapists. We're absolutely equal at the table here. And uh, I, that's one of the things that's really important. And Aaron, can you just talk a minute about how you see this as a practitioner in the field um, and how that's gonna work for you? And you worked for an osteopath for a long time as well. I did work for an osteopath. And um, in my time talking to him, I learned that we spoke very different languages. Um, things like tight, short, and tight, long, he had no idea what that meant, which I thought was very basic. Um, we almost couldn't talk about a number of subjects because we had no common ground to work with. Um, currently, I have a lot of clients coming in and they tell me um, what their physical therapist says to tell me. And to me, oftentimes, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, it would be very nice if, if we could just have a common language um, across the board. The, the clients would experience such a greater benefit if we were all speaking the same language and could easily um, communicate that instead of these hurdles. Um, and Sandy, I just wanna say that is so correct. In these meetings, I never feel like the smallest man on the totem pole. Um, I kind of went in there thinking that it might look like that just because our education level is shorter than everybody else's or most others. Um, but it is very equal and it's very refreshing to see that there's actually a place where this could exist cohesively in our future. Um, I know it would make my job easier. It would make all of our clients benefit um, exponentially. And I think it would be amazing to see the research um, that we can all gain from this quickly. Thank you, Aaron. Now, I'm gonna share my screen again and I'm gonna show you where the foundation for the language came from. And it did not come from me. And, and I, I want that to be important because sometimes people think that those that have been around a long time or, or write a textbook or whatever, that they're trying to push their ideas. And um, the, the language that was put forth was based on ELAP. And, uh, and so um, it's, it's a project that we did that has not had the amount of traction that it should, which is unfortunate. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can uh, really um, start to embrace all that hard work that was done. And if it needs to be updated, it needs to be updated. But I just looked at it thoroughly just a year ago, and it's not as dated as some might say. So it's elapmassage.org where you find all the documents, but I'm gonna open up a uh, part of the, the report. Uh, so here we go. So 
So this is the core. Part of the issue with the ELAP was that it, it's unwieldy. It's too big. It's too big and it's too comprehensive. And so what happened with it is that people just put it off to the side. So um, I encourage people to go back to that and look at it. And I was not on the committee. So it's not like, you know, uh, there was, it, it's not like um, there was a, 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 a me trying to manipulate where this all went. But what happened is, is that as they were trying to sort all of this out, they realized that committee realized that there was too many names for the same thing. And it was really a conundrum for entry-level education. And this is about our entry-level educational process. So, uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, where I am taking you to is the part of the platform where they talk about language for massage and we're getting to it right here um so six it's on page 159 and this is uh the hours rationale for massage and bodywork application but what i want to bring your attention to is the core concepts of massage and bodywork application. So mechanical forces and soft tissue deformation, and then these terms, gliding, torsion, shearing, elongation, oscillation, percussive, static joint movement, and hot and cold methods as part of our scope of practice. Now, depending on what form or style of massage that you practice, there might be a, a uh, name within that uh, form that describes gliding. Uh, and we, we think of the Swedish form, where, you know, which is common in many massage uh, programs. Uh, it the, the French terms, the classical slash historical French terms um, are familiar, like effleurage. Um, but others, other manual professions don't use those terms. Or if I'm talking to somebody in a uh, Eastern-based discipline, uh, uh, myofascial work, um, uh, these don't necessarily make any sense to them either. The idea of effleurage or petrissage or static hold or J-stroke or scooping or all those other terms that are out there, depending on what you're looking at. Um, but this, these describe introduction of the mechanical forces that load the tissues that deform the soft tissue. So this is the foundation from which um, we presented what our common language could be within the massage community. Anybody have any questions uh, quickly about the ELAP? Um, just unmute yourself and, and throw those out. And I wanna strongly encourage you to go back and look at that document. Um, and it, because I, when I sat amongst the other professionals, I was really proud of ourselves that we had already done this kind of work and based it on our scope of practice as well. So from that, um, what I was able to do and then Jeffrey and Aaron and others that were involved is we then described, we did reporting templates, we developed a glossary and we made a mind map of what we do. And 
these reporting templates, <laughs> we had to go, we had to go through, I'll show you them. We had to go through and we had to describe what we do. And then we had to put some research in there about it and um, that, you know, for reference periods. And then we all presented. So the massage therapy group presented to the rest. And then the physical therapy group presented. And, and that's where we started to realize, huh, I didn't know they could do that. Is that what you call that? Wonder what that looks like. You know, that, <laughs> that's where all that came into play. But what I really want to show you now is this mind map because it is a nice visual. It's a nice summary. Um, and you can start to see where the thought process goes with it. There we go. All right. Now I got to make it a little smaller. Can you see mine, Matt, Jeffrey? Yeah. My students know if you're on the top of the screen, you're the one that has to tell me if you can see it. This is massage therapy. Um, while we've got the big picture up here, this is, this is our common ground right here, which is manual therapy. What do we do with our hands, forearms, feet, whatever? And on this side, when we go the little line that you have out there, and, and we'll look on that a little bit more here in a minute, but that has to do with how we would affect osseous structures, primarily joint, direct joint function. And then the other side where it's got a lot going on is how we affect soft tissue. And um, this is where you're gonna see the importance of the uh, terminology and where we uh, feed back into work that had been previously done. So, because it is uh, faster, um, so therapeutic forces on the body, that's manual therapy. So massage absolutely is a form of manual therapy. And we primarily have joint movement methods that have as close to a direct effect as we can on joint structure. Um, and then there's a description about how that occurs. Uh, mechanical force application causing deformation of tissue, direct mechanical effects, stimulates various sensory receptors, affects regulatory feedback loops within the nervous system, and also affects fluid. Affects fluid. That's what we think. This final tier out through here, these are the three primary areas that the scientists are working on uh, with the, the mountains of research papers they're going through um, to see how that all fits and if we really are accurate in saying that joint movement methods work within this physiological scope. So biomechanical, that, that's joints and movements and kinesthetics. Um, and then we also have neuro, neurophysiological. Uh, that's, we are learning more and more with our own research that most of what we do is primarily working through feedback loops through the nervous system in various ways. And then fluid movement, which is uh, fluids are dispersed throughout the body within um, the movement of the body. So that's pretty simple. Then we go over here and there's massage, massage therapy. That's our discipline. And the manual part of this, what we do with our hands or forearms or feet, um, here are all of our methods. Whoops. So gliding, stroking, effleurage. Note that this is going to go right back to and reference the ELAP document. 
um, compression, pushing down, uh, elongation, stretching, traction. These are terms that we tend to use when we're trying to think about making things longer. Percussion, oscillation, vibration, shaking, rocking. With ELAP, it's under the umbrella term of oscillation. Uh, shear, shear stress, also terms of uh, uh, stressing methods of deep transverse friction, cross fiber friction. We have kneading, twisting, torsion. Uh, petrissage is the uh, Swedish term. We have active and passive joint movement. And then there's another one way down here that I didn't dare move because I was afraid I would mess up the whole mind map. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, static holding methods. So if we were going to take all of these things, the way what we touch, and we combine two or three of them together, then we might have something that we would call lymphatic drain. So if we have a light compression with a, a small excursion to move the superficial fascia uh, that would then affect the the uh, collectors of the lymphatic system, and we did that slowly. Uh, that's how we could then define lymphatic drain in a way that somebody else could understand what we're talking about because they can visualize what it is. The same with myofascial or connective tissue. You know, <laughs> there's a static hold with a glide to an end range. And it's held for a period of time once you get to that point. Uh, and so these have been pulled out in the massage world as kind of unique forms when they're really not. They're adaptations of the applications that we do when we push and pull and twist. So lymphatic drainage, myofascial release, connective tissue, trigger point therapy, neuromuscular, which is primarily an ischemic compression, pin and stretch, active release, that's an ischemic compression with movement, <laughs> um, and muscle energy techniques, PNF, strain counter strain, uh, positional release, and there, and there are educators in our field that will put unique branding names on this, which further confuses the issue. So um, when we come back here, then we're going to say, look, all of this somehow stimulates various sensory receptors, affecting feedback loops, and it goes into that bucket that the scientists are working on with neuroregulation or it's working with interstitial fluid exchange, uptake by the collectors, movement of lymph throughout the body with pumping actions, where, whether it is pumping actions at the joint or uh, the heart or the breathing rhythm or whatever. And that ends up in this bucket as far as the scientists are concerned. So are we really, are we really doing what we think we do? We don't know that. And then actual mechanical force application that makes the tissue change shape. It flattens it out or it lifts it up or it makes it longer or it puts a kink in it or it takes the kink out or, or whatever. And those things would then go into the bucket around direct effect. And if I back out of this, Everything connects to everything. So then the other thing we have in our scope of practice is instrument assisted. So this is when you suck something up with a cup or you scrape something with a something, a tool. Um, 
And if you, or if you uh, vibrate or beat on something where you're using something other than your hands. And these are all within our scope. And interestingly, we think they all work on the very same mechanisms as our actual manual work. And they influence the very same uh, buckets that the researchers are looking at. So, how about that? That only took two years <laughs> to get to. <laughs> All right. So, um, Let's, before I go and show you all of our glossary and everything, let's have a little bit of uh, some discussion. Um, and we can use the chat for this. So Aaron and Jeffrey, if you'll monitor the chat a little bit. If everybody will just quickly put a post in the chat about, um, You might, uh, Julie, while well, I'm going to answer this right here, you may not be able to get access to that mind map uh, because that is it's still a work in progress. And the whole thing will then, it's part of the whole big thing. And um, all the other professions have mind maps and then that will be released at the conference. So the, that link went way to one of my Google Doc things. So. Who's heard of ELAP and haven't done that? So we can do it with some hands. Nobody, so, so that's something that would be important to know. You know? And uh, also in the chat here, if you want just real quick, um, if you would uh, uh, put in there a yes or a no, um, have you heard of the terminology gliding, kneading, that sort of thing? And just put that in there because that gives us an idea. And Ruth is saying here that she used ELAP to structure her book. Very good. Good job. Good job. Well, we had that. We had some of that. Um, that we brought to the table and I was very proud of that, that we had that. And that um, the way we describe the modifiers, you know, you can, you can twist something fast or slow, you can um, hold on to it long or short, you know, and if you use these kind of descriptors, you can define any style or form that's out there in a common language. So Whitney is saying, I've heard of that terminology It's borrowed from physics. I don't know if it's getting too particular, but there are some concerns with the accuracy of these terms. Uh, Whitney, are you talking about the idea of that since ELAP came out, um, the understanding has progressed that when we do something that's a push or a pull, or, and if you push and pull in opposite directions, you have a twist, which it, that loads the tissue. It's a mechanical load. And then that load creates a stress in the tissue. And the tissue then re, is going to respond somehow to that stress. And the response then to that loading that stresses the tissue um, changes the shape, uh, will, will create some sort of a response, whether it is by, um, having the, um, sensory receptors that are mechanically deformed and it goes through feedback loops in the nervous system, or is there some direct influence on fluid exchange from that tissue, that change in shape, that loading of that tissue? Or is it uh, 
a uh, mechanical, is there an actual mechanical thing that's happening maybe in the ground substance pliability or something? Um, so uh, I think that when ELAP is updated a little bit, that we can make that be a little bit more accurate. Now, is that what you were thinking about? Well, sort of. Um, it kind of gets back into, and I have to pull up my copy of the ELAC doc document. I don't have it in front of me on terms of what page it was on. But I remember having some concerns with the committee when they were doing this, when they were using these terms. Because, for example, the term torsion is a little bit, uh, the, some of the techniques that they put under that category, if I remember correctly, did not really... Uh, were not things that would be described by a torsion force because torsion really does mean twisting and there are very little tissues that we can actually twist. Um, we can, as you mentioned, put tensile and compressive loads on those forces and maybe the skin might be something that you might consider being, you know, subjected to some type of torsion, but under the skin, it's almost impossible for us to apply torsion to most different tissues underneath there. And they had a bunch of techniques, if I remember correctly, in the ELAP document that fell under that category that I thought were really mislabeled because of that. And I think that you're accurate on that. Um, and I, I think that the concept of moving towards mechanical loading, mm -hmm. what that does, I think then that they were trying to figure out, here are the things we already got named. And so where do we put them? Yeah. And I think that is that that is something we can address that did not come into play with the project here. Um, but it would be a, a point of clarification for us. Yeah. And um, mostly what we do is some sort of a compressive load. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we can do a pull. We can push mm -hmm. pull. And some twisting, so there can yeah. be some twisting, which, you know, and then you try to say, is that petrissage? Well, everybody does petrissage different, so I don't know. Yeah. You know, so the methods, petrissage, kneading, J-stroking that you would find in maybe some myofascial or whatever, you know, when you look at that, what kind of a load is that? That's mm -hmm. what we need to get to. We're yeah. loading the tissue this way, and for how, and then the modifiers, how long, in what area, in what direction, you know, those are the kinds of things. And, and we're further along, we're further along than, than uh, sometimes we give ourselves credit for. I, well, I think that was a huge leap forward when the ELAP did that and, and got away from naming modalities and got into describing them based on physical principles. That was just a, a milestone, a huge milestone. So I think that's great that that's the, the jumping off point. Uh, um, so, and it doesn't discredit our various forms and styles. It doesn't take away from, oh, um, somebody who is adapting massage to more specifically target uh, superficial fascia movement or gliding or sliding. Um, and they might call that myofascial release. So they might, call it, who knows how, ma the, how many names there are out there for that. And, and we need to get down to what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Because other disciplines do this stuff too. So, uh, any other comments on that before? Because uh, I think this is the crux of where we're at. I'm glad you brought that forward. Uh, uh, Ruth Hello. Is, uh, yes. Mary Biacolano. Thanks, everybody. So I know that also I'm, I'm pretty familiar. I've uh, been in a lot of these working committees, but I guess making sure I would agree with Whitney that um, it is challenging to describe, right? But if we also probably need to get ourselves in alignment with some of the nomenclature with the JBMT. You know, so the JBMT uh, often uses words like vector or vector or direction of force, which yeah. then can create that secondary shear or secondary twist. So I'm not trying to reinvent this. I just got involved in this programming, but I do know that, you know, these guys are doing, you know, 400 research publications per quarter. Their book is seven pounds, 
just this month alone. So I hope that we can also get somebody from the either the publishing committee or some of the other folks on there to make sure we're in alignment with them yeah. as well. Many of the scientists we have also publish in there. And I, I don't want to specifically talk about my textbooks, but I am going to for a minute. I use that terminology. I talk about vector. I bring all of that kind of stuff in at entry level. Um, and, you know, and then I try to give examples of how it might show up in a form or a style that we have as massage. You know, so um, it's, and it certainly shows up in how we describe what we do with the foundation, the massage therapy foundation. Uh, one of the feedbacks that we've gotten is, is that the, the methods couldn't be replicated because there weren't enough descriptors to really explain what was done. So it made it difficult to validate the quality of that that research. And so the Massage Therapy Foundation is doing a great job slowly, slowly, slowly bringing research literacy to the point where somebody's eyes aren't going to turn inside out, not just students, but educators, because they weren't taught what those terms meant. So very good, Mary. Ruth. Yeah, if I can speak to that just a little bit, Sandy. Um, among other things, the foundation has produced the care guidelines for yes. uh, that, that just create some standards in reporting case reports for massage therapy <clears throat> and, and always goes, always really emphasizes the importance of descriptive language rather than proprietary language, um, because for the very reasons that we've been talking about here. So it's just a way that these nomenclature projects have practical application right from the get-go. And um, they're critically important so that we are all speaking the same language. That's all I needed to say. Yeah, and I'm gonna put in there a little bit with a challenge to our continuing education providers in the massage therapy world that um, it, usually under trying to differentiate how their approaches are unique, um, they become branded with language that further silos us. Uh, and if we could have um, a, the ability within these to move backwards, not backwards, but to move into a foundational language structure to understand then uh, what the various continuing education providers are, are doing. And Whitney, I know you do that when you provide your continuing education. You talk about location and, and direction and you know, depth and um, as opposed to uh, some sort of naming nomenclature terminology that uh, like fluffing or, mm -hmm. or stroking or uh, smoothing or you know, somebody I mean else help me out with that. Yeah, that almost seems like that would be an entire other committee. I mean, I think it is heinous and egregious. I've snuck in and listened to lots of other CE providers. I'm a continuing provider myself and strictly science-based and I go to all the big meetings and I go to read all the research to keep the proprietary stuff out and any of the, you know, catchphrases that we use out, strictly talking science-based. So if you want to do a whole separate committee on that in the future, <laughs> I'd sign up for that because I think that is almost where it's the worst. Yeah, mm -hmm. and as an entry level educator, that that I mean, I do continuing education, but my my passion is entry level, and I will use examples, metaphor, whatever, to try to get the students to understand you know, or have a visual in the head, you know, because uh, I'll say, okay, one of the things I tell them is a nerve, nerves, think of major nerve trunks like worms. They're like worms. They, they, they're soft and they're squishy and they don't like to, they don't like to get pressed. And so they're in areas that are more protected. 
Now, I don't want my students to go around marking up on their charting. So I release the worm in the leg. I don't want them to do that. But I think what has happened in the past is some of these catchphrases that teachers used, you know, so we're going to do a, we're going to do a, a pony stroke where like you're riding a pony or some of these kinds of things that I've heard that we, we really got to get over that. But I know where it comes from. It is at least some of it is teachers trying to find ways to help their student embrace you know, the concept of what's going on. So, but as educators, we also have the responsibility to take it the next step on that as well. Speaking of the next step, share screen. Um, let's look at where our next step went. Whoops. Who can share? Can I share still? So here are, and you probably won't get access, you won't be able to get direct access with this, but this, oh my goodness, what a task this was. Where did it go? So this is just the muscle energy or muscle energy. This is just the massage therapy group of files in through here. And so let's look at this, this, uh, let's pick one. Let's look at this glide stroking effleurage thing here. See if it'll open up for me. Hey, Mary, you're on the top there. Can you see something that says profession massage therapy? Yes, correct. Yes, we can see it. You're sharing. All right. So this, so, so through many trials and errors, and I just want to compliment um, Dr. Brian on how he has led this group of cats. I mean, my master's degree is in organizational leadership. And so I could see through some of the things he was doing with his process. Um, but he was very deliberate with it, but also very, not sneaky, but he didn't unfold the whole thing at a time. So he just took us step by step by step as a leader should to the point where we were able to actually describe what we do. Um, and that was not easy <laughs> to, to get it down to those descriptors. Um, so for every method, we had the technique name, then we had to describe it. And then we had to do, you know, how we applied it. So with this one, the distinguishing characteristic of gliding strokes is their horizontal application and relationship to tissue fibers, which generates a tension stress. Gliding also can be across, you know, and, and I'm not going to read all of this to you tonight. But, uh, and this is just a start. That's what's exciting about this. This isn't in stone. When, when we get to the conference, when we work with this, both in our own group and interdisciplinary, people who are in attendance get a chance to make this bender, or bender, I was looking at bending right here, make this better. Whitney, like you were talking about, to look at what we've done so far and clean it up, make it crisper. You know, that is what we all want to do. Uh, and that's something else that's unique with all of this, but at least we've got something to start with. A lot of times a big, huge progress, uh, process like this can't get started because we can't get started. You know, I, I've been in meetings for years and years and years where we talked about talking about it. 
I'm telling you, we spent hours in meetings talking about the fact that we needed to talk about it. Whitney, you've been in some of those. Ruth, you've been in some of those. <laughs> so we've taken this to the point where we can actually talk about it. And it, it can be modified and improved. And this, these are all living documents. It's, it's not meant to be, okay, here it is. This is the way it's going to be, which is exciting to me. Then we had to go, well, here's what we think is what's happening. We think this is what's happening. You know, it's, it's stimulating or it's moving fluid or what. Ever and most of this is legacy, not just for massage therapy either. This is this is what we thought we did, and we started to think this was fact. Not just us, but what we think we're doing, especially if somebody taught us that that's what we should think we're doing, and somebody taught them that that's what we think we think we're doing then we start to think what we're doing is a fact and it isn't. Um, and that's where the researchers come in and are gonna go based on what we know now, this, this is likely valid or not, but now we can frame more research to try to clarify that. And away we went with all of that for all of these <laughs> uh, and the other the the uh, other um, professions had even more that they uh, had to do with that so and then shared techniques yes Whitney uh, Sam I'm curious like um, in since we probably more so than most of the other professions in in uh, that are gathering here don't have a really strong research base for a lot of things in our field, what's kind of the, the goal or strategy in dealing with um, things when we have conflicting perspectives or conflicting arguments about things or just really a lack of evidence about a particular thing uh, for defining it? What's gonna be kind of like the strategy well, for handling that? One of the things that has we have talked about as a group is identifying those gaps. Mm -hmm. And, um, Brian, are you on the call? Brian, I see you lurking. Can you un 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 unmute yourself, Brian? Or are you just going to lurk? <laughs> we'll see if he chimes in. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I couldn't. <laughs> Did you hear Whitney's question? I did, and and I would. It is an excellent question. Um, it is uh, basically, as as you were saying, Sandy. Our initial goal, first of all, is to help us put into words what we think we feel in the language that we currently have. From that, try to make sense of it based off of the collective experience within the manual therapies look at what research that has been done that can help to support or refute the, the clinician's current perspectives. And, and that will then help us to identify and then prioritize where we need to head as a uh, scientific community to better understand you know, what's going on underneath our hands when we interact with our patients and our clients. Uh, so a lot of times we feel really insecure about what we don't know. The goal of this is actually to help to identify that in a collective, and that will then allow us to really um, expand the questions that basic scientists are aware of, and then we'll do research in it. Uh, I can tell you I have participated in various meetings held by NIH, and the technologies that are available now to evaluate mechanical properties of tissues is beyond what I could have ever anticipated. The use of MR elastography, magnetic resonance imaging elastography is the cutting edge of how soft tissues respond to physical stimuli. In order, when they become aware 
when the people who do this type of research becomes aware of the type of work that is being done clinically and the type of responses that are being seen, that will allow them to model within their research labs the type of work that we do and as a result help them to translate their outcomes to the type of practice that we do as well. So I hope that gives some perspective. Sandy, am I? Yeah, you you did a good job, Brian. Uh, and can you, you know, sometimes we think we don't have a lot of research. <laughs> hey, Sandy. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you, Doc. Uh, you've got Dr. Angelique Mazira here from Chicago that wanted to say hi to you, Brian. Doc, I got you <laughs> over that way. There you go. I'm Dr. Mazira, part of the osteopathic medical school training. Doc, is, we were both planning to go to the conference. Myself and Dr. Mazira were going to be attending together, and uh, we were bummed out when it was transferred to, uh, yeah, to uh, um, online, but we'll be participating here from our clinic in Chicago. But I would agree with you for sure, Brian, that, uh, thanks, Doc. We've been very uh, lucky, you know, that Siddhartha Sikdar out of NIH and George Mason is doing so much with um, three-dimensional Doppler ultrasound. And I'd say, Sandy, we don't have to understand all the technology, but we can extrapolate and create working hypotheses based on blood flow, amplitude, you know, hy uh, hypertrophy, or even hyperperfusion in some of these smaller cells. So we've already heard from Siddhartha, we've heard from Jay Shah, and uh, it's phenomenal what they're doing. And yeah, I agree with you too, Brian. We just extrapolate and we can take conclusions, make working hypothesize, hypotheses, and then we're hoping to get them here to travel to Chicago, use the 3D ultrasound in combination with some of the manual therapy. So fingers crossed we can make that happen. Well, we'll in addition to that, if we can, uh, the, the five professions that are in this consortium and our outreach to the others that use manual therapy, if we can all, we all glide. There's not one of us that don't glide. So the researchers are more apt to be able to design a research process around that more for all of us, as opposed to a massage specific study um, that may not get as much traction or have access to as much funding out of NIH. So these foundational underlying principles can be research that will benefit all of us, not just massage therapy, not just chiropractic, but because but all of us because we all press. You know, and what happens when that occurs? You want to expand on that too, Brian, because I know that was one of you and Paul's real driving forces on all of this. Uh, Paul and I um, met through the fascia research congresses, and the one that occurred in Vancouver had a very significant massage therapy uh, group there. I think they said almost 70% of, of attendees to that meeting were from the massage therapy group. And, and Paul, as a basic scientist, he basically said at the end of a previous meeting, the one that took place in Boston, that you know, you all are using words that mean absolutely nothing to a scientist. We have no idea what to do with uh, what did you say, riding the horse, or you know, bowstringing this muscle, or whatever you know, term. I mean, all of our professions have those terms. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and and we had. You know, this was 12 years ago, and we had the intention of trying to address it after that meeting. It never happened. And, and, and that's why we decided we were going to try to do this before the meeting, to deal with that hard work before the meeting in order to create a platform um, to really build upon and then sustain momentum after the meeting. Uh, so that's a little bit more background of why we are here. So I, I've got something up here that really brings this down, that mechanical forces, when we touch, however we do it, it is, a, it is an external mechanical force. 
And for massage therapy, these are things we do to introduce a mechanical force. And then we modify those. You know, you can modify percussion or shearing, frictioning, or gliding. You can modify that in innumerable ways by how much drag you've got on it, what your face is, what your feet, how intense you are. Um, and that uh, has, is the nuance on the type of load that stresses these various tissues. That can be studied. And once we realize, you know, chiropractors do that, physical therapists do that, um, but if, if we're calling it one thing and they're calling it another, then there is no opportunity to share in our bigger and broader understanding of what the value is and what we're really doing. So, thank you, Brian. For, I mean, I know I put you on the spot, but I like to do things like that. <laughs> the massage community sometimes feels like um, we don't know enough to work alongside in a collaborative way. Um, and um, I, that's why I'm so glad you're on the call so that they can see that when, if you decide to participate in this conference that's coming up where we're really going to get together and take a, you know, a microscopic look at some of this stuff the best we can in the time that we have, we're all equal at the table here. We're all, you know, there's no competition here. It's all about how can we all work together? And I, and I will say that within the chiropractic group, the physical therapy group and the osteopathy, the osteopathic group, many of them said, wow, I did not realize that massage therapy worked within that type of a realm. And they're more apt to bring massage therapists on board in collaboration if, if we also can communicate with that, especially if we're sharing research. And that was really exciting. So um, now the last piece I wanna show you is our Rosetta Stone. Um, which is a work in progress for sure. And I gotta, whoops. All of the professions, can you see that, Julie, you're on top here. Can you see that? Yep. Here's all of our professions here in the spreadsheet. And um, we, we put our terms in. And then it's in a, it's in a type of document. Jeffrey, our, our, our wonderful tech support, finally got us to put it all into the same type of a document so that all of our terms could then be put alphabetically. And then we could start to see, huh, here, here, here. So here's two definitions of compression. You know, how are they similar? How are they different? Um, here, here's something on contraction and contraction types and creep. And, you know, here's def the, this looks like some of the stuff that the structural integrators put in, but depth of pressure looks like something I put in. And so, you know, this has got a lot of work yet to be done, but for the first time that I am aware of, all of the manual therapies that are working in this group, we have our words, we have our words up here. And if we can clean this up, so that we are using the same words, then maybe Paul Stanley will know what we're talking about. <laughs> and that again, will feel fuel uh, some of the fantastic uh, technology and research 
that we have at our disposal now that we didn't have even five years ago. So muscle energy techniques, almost all, every one of us use muscle energy techniques, but there's different definitions. You know, so if, you know, when I explain, I don't know if you were on that, these calls, Aaron or Jeffrey, but we really had quite an in-depth discussion about muscle energy techniques and which way it pulls and which way, which way does the person contract it and, you know, because we were using different names. Myofascial approaches or myofascial release is another one where nobody really knows what that means. But if we look at what each of us are doing, we're doing about the same thing. So then ultimately is your goal to take out the proprietary or some of the um, trademarked terminology and come That's, to a consensus? Proprietary and trademark doesn't do us any good. Right, so then are you, with the goal ultimately as a working group to come to a consensus, right? That's the whole point is to hone it down to the key words that are gonna be not trademarked, but they're gonna be a descriptor word agreed upon by the greater community. Is that correct? That's what we hope. And it will always be open-ended. It'll also be an advisement because every time we learn something new, we might have to do something to our definition. But you, you explained that pretty good there. And we're not the only profession that has those proprietary terms. You know, and some of these are very historical. Strain counter strain is another one. Um, and it's very similar to something that another one of our occupations would call positional release. You know, and so, you know, if we don't come to some agreement there, then we're not going to be able to. Um, would you also see that maybe under, if you had that primary category, which is column A, again, I'm not, this is your document, I'm not touching it, but are you looking to then subcategorize other techniques that would be taken out of their own line and then brought into a subcategory of a primary line that would be a term found in A? Get what I'm saying? So if you've got myofascial release, ultimately the working group would take that away and move that proprietary term or whatever, a term used in the layperson's field and move it to somewhere else with the dream that it would have a primary word to describe that activity, but you wouldn't use that secondary term for research necessarily. Is that correct? Yes, but that's a big, 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 big job. And the massage therapy community spent 30 years talking about talking about it uh, and and we swirl around in our own circles and we get stuck um and you know this breaking down of silos and and collaboration and this and this is not about taking massage into you know we're going to be in the medical world and it's all about fixing broke stuff because one of our greatest gifts that we have is help well things stay well. It's not about any of that. It's about being able to talk to each other. And, you know, one of the greatest gifts we have is that you don't have to have something wrong to come and get a therapeutic massage that is going to maintain that sense of well-being. Some of the other professions are limited by that, that, you know, that they, they don't get to do that. Um, or, or people won't pay them to do that. Uh, or insurance companies certainly won't pay them to do that. But we, you know, we really are in a, a, a beautiful spot as far as a health profession we absolutely are a health profession. We're in a beautiful spot to be able, uh, you know, we can work autonomously. Um, we 
uh, our scope of practice allows us to be in the wellness industry. And the other occupation, physical therapy is working real hard, real hard to be autonomous right now and be where we're at in terms of business structure and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so we don't, there's, there's no intention for us to lose what we're great at. In fact, the other professions have commented on how wonderful that is. Um, pick on Dr. Brian again, but wouldn't it be wonderful if people came to see you because they just wanted to come see you because it felt good. <laughs> now, that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but it's important. It's really important that that is what we do because we research is showing in the, uh, and that's part of what's going to be the second conference. You know, you can only do so much at any given time, but patient-centered care and the biocycle social models and all of that, we're staying pretty mechanistic with this one. But the, the, uh, the next conference agenda is about now, what happens when two people are together in a therapeutic alliance? And how does that work? Um, so I'm just really excited. I, I see this as one of my last chances that I'm moving into my last 30 years of being on the planet productively, of making a change here. And, and I'm proud of us, by the way, massage therapists, when I have been interacting with the rest of these wonderful, wonderful people from all over the globe, I have been proud of us. So, all right, so what's the next steps? Good stuff. Congratulations. You deserve yeah, a lot of credit. Step. 18. <laughs> the next step is to get involved in the conference. And that is that virtual platform. Um, and in comparison to other conferences, this is very affordable. And I'm, I'm going to say something, Brian, you just don't listen right now. <laughs> this is not set out specifically to be a money-making thing or to support a long-term care type of thing. This is not a political organization. Um, it, and, and I know personally that there are people on this call that have taken money out of their own pocket in order to make this happen. So the registration fees are to pay for what it costs to do stuff like this. And it's not going into a coffer someplace. It's going to be used for something else. Uh, all of us that are on the work groups, the scientists, all of us are volunteers. So um, that's really unique and it's not political and it's not about, you know, it, it, it's about starting something that is a continuum uh, that is multidisciplinary. And so the conference is where you go next. You register for the conference and then you're going to get your, you're going to get to go to gather town for our conference and we get to do all sorts of fun stuff. Let's see if I can take us there. I ran into Brian there one time at Gather Town, scared him, scared his little emoji, just scared it. <laughs> okay. Julie, you're on top. Can you see my little emoji, my little gray haired emoji there? All right, I did that myself. And I'm not a gamer. Anybody who's a gamer, this is gonna, this is, this virtual world is amazing. All right, can uh, Joanne, I can see you, Joanne Randall. Can you see this screen? I'm standing in the middle of it. I'm gonna move around. There I go. Whoop, I ran into a wall. Oh. Oh. There I can go. Now I'm going to go for a long walk over here. Oh, and and I'm going to go up. What's up here? Oh, wow. Here's our garden. Remember we've got this for a whole 30 days. Um, and so we can put up on the, the schedule board 
um, Sandy and Aaron and Jeffrey are going to be hanging out in the park on uh, May 16th. Let's just gather and chat. Oh, and when we have our formal scheduling uh, and our keynote speakers, you know, we'll meet in the hall. If there was another icon in here and it bumped up against me, we can talk to each other. Our little faces will come up. You know, there's a little thing that you push, a little X that you push, and, and, and it calls in. And then when I snuck up on Dr. Brian, you know, his, his little emoji jumped you know, and the whole, you know, who's there? Who's calling me? Uh, we can go into these big rooms, these big auditoriums, and uh, there's a game room in here, and, you know, places where you, you know, we've all been to conferences. We know what it's like in the hall. That's where the real stuff happens. Uh, the exhibitors are down here. There's poster sessions. Oops. Oh no, I disappeared into the virtual world. Oh, there I am. We can go sit in this room and talk private. Oh, it's so there's it's it's a beautiful little venue. And uh, at least for massage therapists who some often do oh oh Brian's in. You got a new hat on, Brian. Where are you? Come see me. Okay, got it. So it's a super nice platform. Sounds great. When the conference does begin, for example, if uh, Dr. Langevin is going to give her lecture, it will be as if she was on a video, correct? It will be like a projected screen yes. of her talking like this. It won't be her. Right. Okay, good. And right. there's, there'll be platforms for questions and answers and all of that. So did you find me yet? I'm 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 right in this spot right here. So if you're wandering around in there, Brian, you can come, you know, scare me or something. Um, for for massage therapists, the cost factor of being away from work um, and the travel and the the room and everything like that just makes it unwieldy for many massage therapists. Oh. Hey, you better stop. You better stop. <laughs> so we can go, we can have a talk. I can come, you know, and then I can bring him for school. Yeah, we're going to get a lot of feedback here, so I better leave you alone, Sandy. All right. So, um, I, d I wanted you to not be afraid of that platform. Uh, and I want you to, you know, to embrace the idea of it can do, we got so many opportunities to do so much more um, in this kind of a platform, especially with it being over that whole month period with the four days of formal scheduling. So what y'all think? Is it this concern anybody? No, I think that you guys have done a great job of really highlighting some of the key nomenclature. I think that coming to consensus is going to be critical. I think you've hit just about every venue, every avenue of defining what it is, what we do. And then it's trying to get people's input. And I've already registered for the event, so <laughs> I'm not canceling my ticket. I'll be hanging out hopefully at the university and maybe listening from there locally, but I think it's gonna be great. So thanks for all the work. Uh, well, we're totally virtually online. Um, there was concern with the, uni the university with COVID too and stuff that was going on. So this was just the best decision overall. And uh, it's, it's, but it's not gonna be sitting in front of a webinar with people with a bunch of PowerPoints. It's not going to be like that. Uh, it is, it's going to be um, the ability to have the one-on-one -on -one discussions. 
You know, Norm Kettner is just wonderful. He was not going to be able to attend in person, but he will be able to attend this way. He's a he's just an icon in research. He's just fantastic. And and you'll be able to walk up and have a conversation with him. Um, Cross discipline. You know, how exciting is that? And some of our formal scheduling is set up so the disciplines are in the rooms together in small group format so that we can um, understand how we can all work together to better help our clients too. Any concerns? Any concerns? Well, this looks good. Well, Sandy, I want to just thank you. I haven't left the earth. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some of my graduates and even some of my students on this call because they're the future. This, <laughs> our students that are in entry-level education with massage right now are our future. And we, uh, those of us that have been around a long time, massage has been good to us. Um, I think it's important that we commit to allowing them to move forward into that future. Um, and so we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to change how we, you know, we talk a little bit over time. Um, we're going to have to stop and think when we are in our entry level classrooms, for those of you that are instructors. You know, when we give somebody a, a, a cutesy name for a technique that we back out of that, you know, and we challenge them to, um, you know, talk grown up <laughs> with what we're doing. Uh, but it's not going to change, you know, how we interact with our clients. Uh, so, um and those of you that have been around a long time that have spoken, Dolly and Ruth and some others, uh, we've been talking about talking about this for a long time. And so I, I am personally thankful that um, Brian and Paul and others um, actually made it happen and that massage therapists were invited in as equal partners on that. So, Sandy, can I ask a question? Well, of course. Well, thank you. Hi, being that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of just supposed to be a fly on the wall for this meeting, but um, so the question is, how can we engage people on this call now? I've ha heard people ask questions. Well, can we get access to the mind map? Well, the mind map is something that requires um, costs in order to be able to get into that program. But it is something we could potentially make hard copies of and have people, you know, um, um, make comments and, and help to make connections. I, I think my assessment of massage therapy is really trying to collapse terminology to the most fundamental terms that you all can agree upon, can be comfortable with. And that's something that I don't think will necessarily occur overnight. Um, so how do you suggest moving things ahead at this time, Sandy? Well, and I, I would like others to speak up to that, but I think maybe we could use the ICMT website for some hard copies on this. People that register and they can download them. Um, Jeffrey will have to get in on that, I know. Um, and is not the people, aren't the people that are registered for the conference gonna get a packet of information prior to the conference that they can work mm -hmm. with? Yes. Um, so, so that when you come to the conference, you've already got some of your thoughts down. Um, and you know, there's access to all those templates and stuff that I showed you. Um, and you got to remember, they're all this is a, 
it's not a total rough draft. I mean, I write rough drafts that are really rough, but it's certainly not written in stone. There's certainly room for smoothing the language. Um, but it'll be particularly helpful at the conference when you get a chance to interact with other the other professions. So you can, you know, you can appreciate their own language struggles. Um, maybe Brian, you can highlight a, a language um, issue that you had in the osteopathic working group where you had to work around what are we going to call this or you know, uh, you know, this is this is confusing or somebody else, one of the other occupations isn't gonna, they're not gonna know what we're talking about. Do you have an example from your world? Well, certainly when we, we have classifications for um, cranial manipulation, for visceral manipulation, for these more subtle types of techniques. And we've really, have had some pretty dynamic discussions on what really makes those things unique or are they really unique? Um, and we're gonna be coming to the conference with, um, with some things that are definitely gonna be challenging just within our own profession in regards to the scientific characterization, the terminology used for what we used to think were really pretty distinct separate terms. Um, and, and may not be as separate as we thought they were. Uh, so um, these are things that we're going to be discussing uh, within uh, the osteopathic community prior to the meeting so that when we're walking in there, we have, you know, a good sense, you know, of where we are, are you know, think we're heading and what we might be recommending across the other professions that have similar techniques, but may have different languages as well. Um, so I think um, getting each profession within themselves as much on the same page heading into the conference is gonna be helpful. Um, as you mentioned, Sandy, uh, we're gonna be, for those who are registered within April, you're gonna get a packet of information and that's gonna have you, so you can see what the other professions have also done. So you can be, as you are preparing or looking at things in preparation for the conference, you can do some comparing and, and contrasting between the languages from one profession to another, looking at definitions of techniques and say, wow, that's really what we do too, or wow, that's not how we do it at all, but we use the same name or, you know, we use different names, but really it's the same thing. I mean, that's how we're going to break down the barriers that have artificially existed over the last century in order to develop a, a, a framework to help progress our understanding through a scientific investigation uh, format. Um, so, so once again, if there are ways that we can provide you information on the glossary, on the mind map, on the technique descriptions, that are within the, the um, massage therapy arena that will help you all come to, you know, say, you know, really kind of boil down to the key essence of, of what you do with your hands and, and to minimize aspects of redundancy in your terminology. That's really gonna help as we enter into that conference. Well, and you said something I think is really important, Brian, and uh, you use the word unique. Every time any of us interact with a client or a patient, that interaction is unique. It's always unique. But what we do um, may not be. You know, the way we glide or the way we need or the way we move something or the way we, we um, pump something. Um, those things probably are not that unique, uh, but they separate us. They so separate us. And uh, if we can embrace our uniqueness as we work with in our therapeutic clinician space without trying to differentiate ourselves as so unique amongst each other. That has just got us 
so separated. Um, and it's sad. You know, I've been around long, 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 long time. And uh, I would like us to not be so separated uh, within our massage therapy community and then with the others that also do a lot of the same things we do. Their education might be different, their, so their scope of practice might be different. Um, but our scope of practice is very broad and we have a tremendous amount of, to offer within the larger um, profession, within the larger manual therapy umbrella. Um, but we got to know how to, you know, to talk once we get in the room. I would say one of the things for me um, would be to make the goals and make the make the multiple goals. Like Brian, I think what you really said, break down the barriers, get each profession to work on their own nomenclature. Those are very attainable and very concrete goals. Like up until this minute, I really and I've already paid for this. I already signed up a few weeks ago. We were coming to some of the first people out of Chicago to register, I think more than one of the first days, thanks to Dr. Mazira, an osteopath. But um, I, I don't even think it's very clear on the website yet. So to really project what the, have a really, boom, a real clear pop up that says, because I'll be promoting to my association National Association of Myofascial Trigger Point Therapist. I'll make sure I let everybody know about the meeting. I've already e-blasted it to my students. Being online is going to be even easier. But they asked, well, what's the what's the deal or what's the purpose? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'm going hiking in Sedona when it's over. I think it's going to be great. So <laughs> uh, I think setting those goals and even, you know, broad things like that, whether they're philosophical or descriptors, I think getting you guys who are the key committee members to really set those goals and make those real clear, to come to a consensus on nomenclature, break down barriers, uh, find things that we have in common versus things that we are different. Boom, right. if that was really right on that front page, I think it would be easier for the standard massage therapist to register and see that even to gather your unique opinion, let everybody know that they'll have the opportunity to express their opinion. I think we'll get way more people to register. Thanks. Thank you for the input, Mary. So um, if you have connections within the massage therapy community with some of our professional organizations, and could uh, encourage them to also be aware and involved. Um, yeah, this is the unique thing about this consortium is it's truly grassroots. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly been a bottom up word of mouth, working together kind of a thing, spreading the word. It's, it's absolutely not political, which has been an ongoing issue within the massage community, but not just us. Um, and your, you know, I don't know where Erin's at. I lost her. Oh, there she is up there. She's got quite a network of massage therapists within her community that she's been working with. Um, schools. With, I've got first year I've got first year students on this call, uh, and you know there we'll talk about this um, when we're in class. And you know what does this mean to you? How is this going to influence your uh, movement into your professional growth? Um, so there's lots of ways through a grassroots type of a movement to get this word out about the importance of this conversation. Uh, you know, another idea, I don't know if you guys have worked with Canva. I'm sure Jeffrey, you have. I think it'd be really easy if you guys if you guys could create a Canva, which would really just be a JPEG file. Everybody that's on this call or all the email addresses you have, you just send it out, it comes out as a PNG. And then you get everybody on the call or everybody in the committees 
can use that as a quick way to post on Insta. You could post these Canva files right on Facebook. Then you don't have to have each one of us typing, where is it, when is it, here's the link, what are they doing? I think, Jeffrey, if you're familiar with Canva, it's a real easy way to get a chunk of data and it just comes out into being one single thing. We've done that for the um, Padua, Italy conference that we're having with Dr. Steckel. So if you guys don't know that, you can email me. My daughter could make you one in probably five minutes. <laughs> get, the, get the young people who work for free. <laughs> and I'm noticing some other committee members, other working group members that are on the call. I see Crystal down there uh, as an example, which goes to show how important it is for them to understand you know, taking the time for us to under, for them to understand us and for us to understand them. Um, you know, and uh, to, to be able to be truly complementary in a broader interdisciplinary approach that spans wellness and well being through rehabilitation and reclaiming our life or comfort care. Uh, in situations where uh, people are approaching end of life. There's such a broad spectrum of this. So anybody else have any questions or comments or, you know, we've, we've, you've got us some marching orders. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that we're just, this is just a place to start. We waded through a lot of stuff, so we have a place to start. Are we good? Are we excited? All good, wonderful. We'll get everybody to sign up and we'll all pass the word through all of our contacts. Thanks so much. We really appreciate your work. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for those that stepped up. You know, uh, I will be eternally, you know, eternally appreciative to Paul Stanley and Brian and the others that stepped up and said, this is so important, we need to make it happen. So, all right. Thank you all so much. Uh, each person that comes makes, a, you know, and starts to understand is one more person that makes a difference. Jeffrey, you got any closing, closing words on all of this? No, thank you, Sandy, for all your work and for bringing us in and I look forward to the conference and to um, the continued work. Uh, thanks for all of you who contributed. Uh, Erin came to me about a year ago and she said, I am ready to be involved in something that's going to make a difference. And I said to her, I know exactly. <laughs> I know exactly what that is. <laughs> so, um, and remember our future. Those of us that have been around a long time, engage our future. Reach out to those that are beginning to help bring them into this so that they understand and can contribute. Because uh, it, it's their future, not ours. It's theirs. So we want to make sure that we're creating that through our, our young ones coming through entry-level education and moving into our, our very important profession. Um, so, ta-da, ta-da, there we go. All right, thank you all the people that are behind the scenes on this, made sure that I was pushing a button that worked. Um, <laughs> and Make sure I was on the right screen. Uh, so many people behind the scenes, so many. Um, you'll get a chance to interact with. So I'm I'm thrilled with everybody that was here and uh, we'll get ready for the next step. Um, and just watch, I mean, I try to, po I drive Facebook mad with all of my posts, but uh, should we decide to have another preliminary meeting like this, it'll be all over the place so that you can find it. And um, then we'll, we'll all meet together with our little avatars 
and uh, have a great month, a whole month of, of formal and informal interaction. You know, I'm, I'm really excited. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you, Brian, for letting me include you, even though I knew you were a fly on the wall. <laughs> well, at least you didn't hit me and splat me on the wall. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>